بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد We're continuing in our classes on the book موجبات الاستغفار We went over a brief biography of the author in the first حلقة In the second حلقة we went over his introduction And this is the third حلقة where we're going to go inshallah over the first of seven causes for istighfar that the author mentions. The first one is he calls al-qusur al-asliyu lil-bashar, the original shortcoming in humans, or the insufficiency of humans. What does he mean by shortcoming or insufficiency in humans? He means no matter how much effort humans exert in worshiping Allah or thanking Him, we can never give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala His full do right of thanks or worship, it's impossible no matter how much we exert in ibadah and hamd to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone was to exert his entire life in total ibadah, in obedience, he wouldn't give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is befitting of him in hamd, thanks, or ibadah, worship. So you do istighfar for that shortcoming. This cause for istighfar also encompasses Matters of the dunya, which the author did specifically touch upon, but it's included in the general topic. Meaning, we would never be able to thank or worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough for His graces in this dunya before what's in the akhirah. Bakr al Muzani said, if you want to see how fortunate you are or the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon you, then close your eyes. Meaning, close your eyes and imagine you're blind. And that's actually a quote I've seen and you see on billboards and signs in areas in the West. It was actually said by Bakr al-Muzani who lived approximately a century after the Hijrah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's documented in our classical references. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala created you from non-existence. He provided for you sustenance. He sheltered you. He strengthened you. He bestowed bounties upon you. Some you see and others you don't see. Even doing your ibadah, doing your ibadah, your worship, your obedience, your deeds, those in themselves are a ni'mah and a blessing from Allah upon you. We alhamdulillah admit that his blessings are incomparable and enormous. The blessing of tawheed alone, referred to in the Quran as ni'mati, wa atmantu alaykum ni'mati, that by itself is sufficient for one to drop in sujood his entire life and he still wouldn't satisfy a slight portion of thanks to Allah for that blessing. One could never give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due right in thanking him for just one of the vanishing dunya blessings. So how is it possible to thank him enough when we're not able to count his blessings. If it's impossible to count his graces upon us, how is it possible to fully thank him? Our inability to thank Allah enough is a reason for istighfar. The Shaykh said, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he accepts and is pleased with what little deeds we perform and he doesn't burden human beings with ibadat and responsibilities heavier than they are able to bear. And he doesn't request the entire time in ibadah. Then he mentions, the author mentions three ahadith pertaining to this topic throughout this cause. The first hadith that he mentions is muttafaqun alayh with slight uh, various terms in Bukhari and Muslim. And the authority of Abu Huraira, لَنْ يُدْخِلَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ عَمَلُهُ الْجَنَّةِ The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, or in another narration, لَنْ يَنْجُوَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ بِعَمَلِهِ لَنْ يَنْجُوَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ بِعَمَلِهِ None amongst you can enter Jannah by virtue of their deeds alone. Your deeds alone would not attain salvation for you. قَالُوا وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا وَلَا أَنَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ بِفَضْلٍ وَرَحْمًا he said, not even myself unless Allah bestows his favor and mercy and grace upon me and pardons me. No one's deeds save him alone, not even the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people have this impression that their deeds are like a payment in return for acres in Jannah. That's owed to them 
and that they're entitled to it. Your deeds are no more than asbab causes to enter Jannah, not a compensation or a return for them. For example, when you go buy an item, you pay the amount and you take your product and leave. The seller must give you the item because you gave him the payment. It's your right to get the product because you paid and it's his right to get the money. After you pay, if he doesn't deliver on the, the item, if you don't take the item, you have a claim and a right against him. That's not how your entry into Jannah works in connection with your deeds. You don't say I have all these rewards and deeds, I'm owed a place in Jannah. You get to enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in compensation or exchange for your deeds. It doesn't work like a reciprocal return owed to you because of your deeds. It's a privilege by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not your do right in exchange for your deeds. There's verses in the Quran that imply one enters Jannah with their deeds. And those verses appear contradictory to the hadith that I mentioned. When in reality they're not. In Surah Al-Zukhraf. وَتِلْكَ الْجَنَّةُ الَّتِي أُرِثْتُمُهَا بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ أُدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ In Surah Al-Nahl. Enter Jannah for what you used to do. أَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ فَلَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْمَأْوَى نُزُلًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ سورة السجدة كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا هَنِيئًا بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ In Surah Al-Tur. Four verses, and there's more. The end with بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ All mean that this Jannah, which you are awarded and you've been made to inherit, is because of your deeds which you used to do in the life before. Those verses seem to contradict the hadith we mentioned. The hadith says, none amongst you enters Jannah by virtue of their deeds. We mentioned that that hadith is not only authentic, it's in Bukhari and Muslim. And it's impossible that they would contradict. There's absolutely no way an authentic hadith will ever contradict another authentic hadith, let alone a ayah. Just like no ayah contradicts another ayah. Accuse your mind before you accuse the infallible text. But here it's easily explained. In the verse or the verses that state entry to Jannah is through deeds, you see bima, the letter ba in bima. That ba, the letter ba, is called ba is sababiyya, the causation ba. The letter ba that's usually prefixed two words. It's the causation ba. It indicates causality here, meaning your deeds are a cause or a reason only. The prefix letter ba has nearly 18 meanings in the Arabic language. In the Quran, it's used approximately 13 or 14 different meanings. Al-Ilsaq, Al-Ta'diya, Al-Isti'ana, Al-Zarfiya, Al-Sababiya, Al-Muqabala, Al-Mujawaza, Al-Ghaya, Al-Isti'la, Al-Tab'id, Al-Qasam, Al-Tawkeed. In the verses of entry to Jannah due to your deeds, the, it's the causation back. In the hadith, which denies entry to Jannah based on deeds, لَنْ يَنْجُوَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ بِعَمَلِهِ بِعَمَلِهِ The ba'in بِعَمَلِهِ The ba' is not the causation ba' like the one mentioned in the verses. It's called ba' al-mu'awadha wal-muqabala. The ba' of compensation and set off. This hadith is denying entry to Jannah based on your deeds being, being a trade-off, meaning you're not entering Jannah as a payback owed to you for your deeds. It's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what's the conclusion in taking the hadith and the ayah, the ayat together? Knowing the prefix ba has various meanings. The conclusion is you enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your deeds are a mere cause, sabab or asbab. That's important because two sects deviated in this matter into two opposite extremes. And that's how ignorant people who think they know a bit of Arabic and become sudden ulama and muftis go wrong. They stumble upon proof or hadith or verses and they think it's the only proof on this matter. 
resulting in taking it out of context of other separate proof, which leads to misguidance. The look at the, the sex, how they deviated in this matter. Al Jabriya said these have absolutely nothing to do with entry to Jannah. It's up to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, up to the Mashiach of Allah, with no aspect of deeds in it. And their proof is a hadith. They took the hadith alone, without the verses. None amongst you enters Jannah by virtue of their deeds. They neglected the verses, so they said it's up to the Mashiach of Allah, will of Allah, and your deeds have nothing to do with it. The other sect, like Al Qadariya, they said deeds are a compensation and a reward and a right for Jannah. Jannah is your right based on your deeds. Their proof is the verses that we mentioned. They all mean enter Jannah for what you used to do. They neglected the hadith on this topic and the explanations. Ibn Taymiyyah said about people which, who have such thinking, they think their deeds to enter Jannah is a compensation and a right like the right in relationship between a landlord and a tenant. Just because you have the cause, which is your deeds, doesn't mean you'll get the goal, which is Jannah. A cause for the crops to grow is rain. Rain is a cause. Rain to crops is like deeds to Jannah. Is rain sufficient for crops to fully grow alone? No. You need other factors. Wind, air, space, sunlight. One who has the cause of entry to Jannah, the deeds, needs another more important, overwhelming umbrella factor way above and beyond deeds, which is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahl al-Sunnah like Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar al nawawi Ibn Abi al-Izz, and other ulama took the proofs combined. They all agreed that entry to Jannah is not in return for your deeds. It's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your deeds are not a compensation for Jannah. They are merely a cause to attain the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The author then says, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-sufficient, self-sufficient, the rich, and we're all poor, and we stand in need of him, he is generous to us. And he mentioned the second hadith and the authority of Abu Dhar, radiallahu an, that's in Sahih Muslim, man ja'a bil hasana, falahu ashru amthalia. Whoever does a deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him 10 times as much. Wa'azid. And I'll add more. Wa man ja'a bil sayyah, fajaza'uhu sayyatun mithluha. Aw akhfir. And whoever does a sin, he get the punishment like it. Or I'll forgive. Wa man taqarraba minni shibran, taqarrabtu minhu dira'ah. Whoever approaches me a span, I'll approach him a cubit. وَمَنْ تَقَرَّبَ مِنِّي ذِرَاعًا تَقَرَّبْتُ مِنْهُ بَاعًا And whoever approaches me a cubit, I approach him a fathom. وَمَنْ أَتَانِي يَمْشِي أَتَيْتُهُ هَرْوَلَ Whoever comes to me walking, I go to him running. وَمَنْ لَقِيَنِي بِقُرَابِ الْأَرْضِ خَطِيئَةً لَا يُشْرِكُ بِشَيْئًا لَقِيتُهُ بِمِثْلِهَا مَغْفِرًا And whoever meets me with an earth lord of sins without shirk, I meet him with forgiveness. Like that. Now pay close attention to the next point by the author. He said, even though your ibadah, your worship, doesn't take but a little bit of your overall time, and even though your age, whatever it may be in this dunya, 20 years, 60, 80 years, more or less, that age in comparison with the age of this entire dunya is short. It amounts to nothing in comparison to the age of the dunya. And they say, they say, well, ilmu Allah, that the earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. And no one knows how many more years until the judgment day, yawm al qiyamah. What's 60 years, your lifespan, in comparison to what they allege that the dunya is, the age of the dunya, 4.5 billion years? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows how many more years until Yawm al-Qiyamah. Let me backtrack and repeat again with, without my additions to get what the author is trying to say. Even though your ibadah, your worship, doesn't take but a little bit of your overall time in this dunya, and even though your age in comparison with the age of this entire dunya is practically nothing when compared 
And even though this entire dunya to the akhirah is like a blink of an eye, Allah rewards His servants for those simple deeds of worship in their short lifespan with that which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined or perceived in a Jannah that's wider than the heavens and the earth and that lasts eternal and forever. Let's assume you worship Allah for 60 years on this earth. You can't deny or even argue that it's more than fair to get 60 years in the luxuries of Jannah and return for it. But from the karam of Allah, the generosity, that's why we say the mercy, from the mercy of Allah, He gives an eternal Jannah. It's not for the time frame equivalent to that of your ibadah. It's eternal and forever. The author then points to the hadith, which is uh, the last person to enter Jannah, who gets 10 times the kingdom of a king amongst the kings of this dunya. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. سَأَلَ مُوسَى رَبَّهِ مَا أَدْنَى أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ مَنْزِلَةً Musa asked, Ya Rabb, who has the lowest rank among the inhabitants of Jannah? قَالْ هُوَ رَجُلٌ يَجِئُ بَعْدَ مَا أُدْخِلَ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ فَيُقَالُ لَهُ أُدْخُلْ الْجَنَّةِ He's a person who comes after those deserving Jannah are admitted. He's, it's, so it's, it's said to him, enter Jannah. فَيَقُولُ أَيْ رَبِّ كَيْفَ وَقَدْ نَزَلَ النَّاسُ مَنَازِلَهُمْ وَأَخَذُوا أَخَذَاتِهِمْ Ya Rabb, how do I enter while the people have already settled in their levels and they all took their shares and portions? فَيُقَالُ لَهُ أَتَرْضَ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَكَ مِثْلُ مُلْكِ مَلِكٍ مِنْ مُلُوكِ الدُّنْيَا فَيَقُولُ رَضِيتُ رَبِّ It's said to him, would you be pleased if you're given like the kingdom of a king Amongst the kings of the dunya, he said, I'm pleased, Ya Rabb. فَيَقُولُ لَكَ ذَلِكَ وَمِثْلُهُ 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 Allah tells him, for you is that, and you get like it, and like it, and like it, and like it, four times. فَقَالَ فِي الْخَامِسَ رَضِيتُ رَبِّي He would say at the fifth time, at the fifth point, I'm pleased. When he gets five times as much, he says, I'm pleased, Ya Allah. فَيَقُولُ هَذَا لَكَ وَعَشَرَةُ أَمْثَالَهُ وَلَكَ مَشْتَهَتْ نَفْسُكْ وَلَذَّتْ عَيْنُكْ فَيَقُولُ رَضِيتُ رَبِّي Allah will say, it's for you in ten times as much. And for you is what your self desires and your eyes enjoy. He says, I'm pleased, Ya Rabb. Look how merciful and generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with that great, mind-blowing, heart-melting reward given all that for what's practically Moments of ibadah on this earth. That's the reward for the last and least person of Jannah. Which doesn't last the age of your life or the age of this entire dunya, 4.5 billion years or 10 billion years. It's eternal to remain forever and ever. Khalidina fiya abada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us in firdaus. So when you realize, A, the shortcoming, insufficiency, Deficiency of your deeds and ibadah in comparison to what is befitting to Allah and what He deserves and what He is worthy of and what is His right and be the shortcoming, insufficiency, deficiency of your deeds and ibadah in comparison to what Allah rewards and what He gives in return. You, real, you realize how desperate you are for istighfar and you understand what the author referred to as the original shortcoming of people, al-qusur al-asliyu lil-bashar. So before we conclude, let me give you this entire halaqa in a nutshell, one-liner. No matter what you exert of ibadah, you are unable to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough as He deserves or for, or for what he gives you in dunya and akhirah. And that's the first cause of istighfar that the author mentions. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.